So far on this channel, we have mainly covered the underground story of Eastern European music. Weird progressive rock bands, the St. Petersburg Tum Tum scene, Siberian punk, Dear Golem. That's all great music, but it has always and sadly will probably continue being a niche underground thing for us weirdos who spent too much time browsing various online pages in their free time. Although I personally prefer listening to lesser known alternative acts, it's good to climb out of your comfortable basement once in a while and check out the general mainstream trends in the country. That's why today's video is going to be about Rockapops. От нежности, от твоей моей свежести Я помню все твои трещинки а -а -а -а, Пою твои мои песенки What is Rockapops, you might ask? Rockapops is what happens when you combine Russia's unhealthy obsession with British culture, twee soft boy aesthetics, and you dump it all in Russia's post-Soviet Wild East environment, which was the 1990s. How did this weird word that is barely a genre capture the feel and culture of late 90s Russia and early 2000s? Why was this at first seemingly harmless music fad so hated and loved at the same time? That's what I will be trying to find out today in the newest installment of the Eastern Archives. To understand the story of Rockapops, we have to go back. We begin our journey in the mid-1980s. Our destination, not Leningrad, not Moscow, not even Yekaterinburg or Siberia. Our story begins on the far east of Russia, in the city of Vladivostok. This is probably one of the most interesting regions in all of Russia. Located on the Sea of Japan, life in Vladivostok was very different from that in the western or center parts of Russia. Due to Vladivostok's border with Japan, the Soviet Russian culture adapted to weird habits that were influenced by its neighbors. One such example are the cars. Even though people in Vladivostok drive on the right side of the road, you rarely find the vehicles with steering wheels on the left side. Teens in Vladivostok had access to hip modern music thanks to Japan, so obtaining information wasn't impossible, unlike in other regions. Due to being so far from Russia's main cultural centers, the people growing up in Vladivostok developed their music scene on their own, with little care or interest of what was happening in other areas. This was best exemplified in the lyrical content. While most St. Petersburg and Siberian bands would spend their energy on trying to write the most angry, anti-Soviet protest song imaginable, open political music and punk imagery was never popular in Vladivostok. People in Vladivostok were too cool to be bothered with all that stuff happening in the country. These guys were chilling on the Far East watching a boot like Akira or something. Siberia's Igor Ladov would note in a Soviet area interview how his favorite place in Soviet Russia to play in was Vladivostok, stating how this region felt much safer than other regions of Russia. In this unique environment, a young teenager by the name of Ilya Lagutenko decides to form his own new wave band with his friends. The band name was Mumitrol, and in 1985 they would record their debut smash hit album, Nove Luna Aprile. <laughs> Well, smash hit in their hometown of Vladivostok, that is. The album didn't spread across the country like crazy or anything. However, somehow it was heard about Artemy Troitsky, who even put the young band in his book back in the USSR. Although the production is minimal and the whole thing gives off amateurish vibes, let's not forget that these guys were barely 18 at the time, I happen to really enjoy this album. It's a fun, pleasant, minimal wave album that was indeed doing its own thing. <laughs> Mo 
most Soviet minimal wave was either some dark artsy concept piece or poetic recitings over cheesy Casio keys. Nova Luna Aprilia, on the other hand, is minimal wave with gleeful twee vibes that demonstrated Legutenko's talents for straightforward catchy pop songwriting. Although the album was mostly harmless and catchy, there was one song that caught the attention of the authorities. Oh yeah, forgot to mention, this was done before the Perestroika rock boom. That was the self-titled track Novelo na Aprilia. Some people interpreted the lyrics as a sort of pessimistic outlook on Gorbachev's perestroika reforms, and that resulted in Mumitoy having secret services get interested in the band's repertoire. It just so happened that very shortly after all this controversy, Lagutenka and his band members got calls to get drafted in the army and the band's music career had to come to a stop. While serving his nation, Lagutenka would get his hands on Boris Grebenshikov's legendary disaster album titled Radio Silence. Lagutenka noted at the time that hearing a Soviet artist backed up by Western producers and having a non-Soviet rock sound was an inspiring moment that showed the great lengths at which Soviet rock bands had come to. This is probably the first and only time I heard a Russian artist compliment this album. Anyway, upon returning from duty, Mumitoy would record their follow-up album Daily Yuyu, which turned out to be a complete failure, both commercially and critically. The band fell apart and Legutenka packed his bags and moved to the United Kingdom. A great musical career had been put to a stop, with Legutenka taking on the role as a translator from English to Mandarin. The dreams of having world tours was replaced with a bunch of trips to London and Shanghai. Now, let's fast forward a bit. It's the 1990s. The battle with the Soviet state is finished. Now Russia is westernized and we can all live happily ever after. So, what is the soundtrack to this new era of Russian history? In particular, what kind of rock music was being made? If you ask someone who were the biggest names in rock music during the 1980s in Russia, the answers will always be relatively the same. Kino, Aquarium, Nautilus Pompilius, DET, Alitsa, Machina Vremini. If you ask someone in the 90s, the answer will be Aquarium, Nautilus Pompilius, DET, Alisa, Machina Vremini. Oh, same bands. Obviously, there was a great underground scene. Hell, I made three videos about that. But when it came to the mainstream, Russian rock music was going through a creative slump. Even though it was easier to obtain Western music, the mainstream was going backwards rather than forwards. You'd think there would be an explosion in mainstream grunge, Mad Chester, or college rock as in the West, but no. Instead, we have the mainstream rock space filled with dudes who, at best, turn to making sappy alternative arena rock such as U2, and at worst, regress to cringy blues rock. The closest we have gotten to something hip in early 90s Russia was Agatha Christie, and even that was very 80s influenced. The early to mid 90s in Russia was a time when basically anything could go mainstream, as long as it was fun and quirky. Weirdo acid rap? Bam, there you go, have some Mr. Malloy. <laughs> Nonsensical Dadaist rave music? No problem, have some Chigunis Karahot. Artsy girl bands, you have Calibri on mainstream Russian pop radio. People started making music for the sake of music. Now you have bands such as Dva Samalyota and Nogus Vela climbing up the charts with songs in made up languages. The 
trend was clear. People are tired of Soviet rock's depressing connotations and are in great need of a new sound. Now, let's go back to Lagutenka. Besides trips to the UK and China, Lagutenka had the habit of flying to Moscow and St. Petersburg to visit the local clubs and restaurants. During Lagutenka's visit to the Tabula Rasa Club in 1996, he accidentally met his old friend from Vladivostok by the name of Leonid Burlakov. For context, Mumitor used a lot of his poems as lyrics for the debut album. The two were happy to meet each other and so they sat down to talk about how their life was going in the 90s. Burlakov was now a moderately successful entrepreneur in Vladivostok. He was an owner of a big music shop that sold various western records. The conversation was really pleasant and at some point the two decided that it would be a great idea to start Mumitor again. Legotinka said that he had written some drafts for possible new songs during his travels and Burlakov said that he was interested in working as a producer. The plan was set. Legotinka has absolute freedom in the creative aspect and Burlakov's job was to get the money for the new album. The two also decided that to make a quality album they had to do what Boris Grabenchikov and the Aquarium did in the 90s. By that I mean recording an album in the United Kingdom. Lagotenka phoned every single past Mumitor member asking if they want to fly over to London to record a new Mumitor album. The only person who was interested turned out to be the band's keyboard player. All the other lads had long forgotten about their teenage new wave band. The duo decided to hire some musicians, most of whom were from the UK. So yes, Mumitor technically is a Russian UK project. With the band member problem sorted out, it was time to look for a producer. Murlakov and Lagutenka decided to bring in Chris Bandy, who was credited for some arrangements on The Cure's acoustic album. And so, now with all the problems taken care of, Lagutenka's new reincarnation of Mumitol begins recording their album in England's capital. During the making of this album, Lagutenka would send a fax to Burlakov in which he described the sound that he envisioned for the album. The album was supposed to sound like a cross between <clears throat> getting ready here. The Lightning Seeds, Sleeper, Space, ABBA, Dub Star, The Cardigans, Orange Juice, Squeeze, Garbage, Blur, A Mandalier, and The Sex Pistols. Little did Burlakov know that Legutenka laid out the influences for the future sound of Russia. The energy in the recording studio was pleasant. Legutenka and everyone present put their love for the music into the album, and now it was time to finish up. The band got a British designer to do the album cover and booklet. Mumitol, a relatively unknown Soviet band from Vladivostok, just finished one of the most legendary albums of the decade, and they didn't even know it. Burlakov and Lagutenka had not finished an album, but who is willing to buy it? Mumitol was never really that big of a band to begin with, and now they have to come back after almost 10 years of dead silence. The two got in contact with Alexander Kushnir, legendary Soviet punk journalist who some of you might know as the author of the book 100 Magnet Albums of Soviet Rock. Kushnir liked Mumitoy's sound and tried to help the band by getting them to perform a concert on the Echa Moskvi radio show. The show's format was pretty simple. The band played tunes and in between radio listeners could call in to ask questions or give their comments about the music. Echa Moskvi's audience didn't like Mumitoy's music one bit. Practically every caller would call in to criticize the band's sound and especially the lyrics which were too abstract and not sharp enough for the Russian audience. How wrong they all were. Along with a failed radio appearance, Bulakov would send out copies of the new album to various big and small indie labels in Moscow, including the legendary Philly Records. The result was negative. Not a single label wanted to pick up the album. Some simply didn't like the music. Others didn't see a potential format for the sort of type of sound. It wasn't appealing to the indie crowd. It wasn't sugary enough for the pop people either. Again how wrong they all were. Legotenka and Burlakov were not discouraged by all these problems. They continued pushing on. Burlakov decided to make a small EP that consisted of five songs off the album. Alone, he went to one of Moscow's biggest markets in the 90s called the Garbushka, and he started handing out the EP for free to literally everyone who was passing by. So basically, Mumitori was the check out my mixtape guy at some point. On the back of the cassette was a phone number and a small note asking people to call local radio stations if they liked the music. One of the people who received the EP was a Russian pop songwriter by the name of Alexander Shulgin. He loved the music, so he contacted Burlakov, who told him that he wants to sign Mumitol to Rec Records, a label that mostly released Eurodance and pop music along the lines of Ivanushka International, with the occasional good rock record in between. 
The signing of Mumitor might have been the best decision in the label's history, since only after a couple of months, Mumitor became absolute superstars. This can be linked to the opening of Russian MTV, which would show the band constantly, sort of how the original American MTV showed Billy Idol in the 80s. Mumitoy became the perfect face of the music channel that tried to promote modern, stylish westernized pop music to the Russian masses. And just like that, a band that started out all the way back in the early 80s, out of nowhere, changed the game in 1997 with their first hit album, Moskaya. How big was Mumitoy thanks to Marskaya? We are talking about a bunch of awards, titles such as Album of the Year and Song of the Year from various Russian music magazines, this includes both pop, alternative and mainstream rock ones. Ilya Lagutenka went from being some translator in London to one of the most recognizable rock stars in the country. <laughs> Okay, it was a big album, but how big exactly? 13 years after Morskaya's release, Afisha magazine, sort of like the Russian Pitchfork, would name Morskaya the greatest Russian album of all time. So yes, according to a group of Russian journalists, Mumitoy's Morskaya outdid everyone's favorite Kino, Aquarium, Auktion, and Lelov albums. Now, I would not go that far, but the album was very iconic and memorable indeed. What made the album so special exactly? Well, the obvious answer is that the songs are amazingly catchy and Lagutenka has a ton of charisma. However, the time of its release is also important. The year is 1997, and Russia is in the position where they have to decide what direction they want to take their country in. Yeltsin had defeated communists once and for all in the controversial 96 elections, and now is the time to decide whether the country wants to stay east or as the village people put it, go west. All of a sudden comes a band with a new sound that is commercial yet tasteful. Rock oriented but uplifting. and completely devoid of the pretentious nature of the bands that came beforehand. Here is a band that can write love ballads for the girls that aren't sappy, and headbanging car driving tunes for the guys that aren't stained with lowbrow gopnik energy. Music fans could appreciate the melting pot of influences. Normal people found their go-to album for social gatherings and drinking pastimes. In a way, Mumitoy accidentally came to define the carefree and hedonistic aspect of 90s Russia. Whether that's a good or bad thing is something for you to decide, not me. Илюша, это был из своего замечательного альбома «Морская». Мы тут уже все морские волки, сам понимаешь. Вспоминаем клип «Depeche Mode» «Everything Can». За первый день продано уже 91 контакт. 
Это в 4 раза больше, чем было продано группы Депешмот в первый день нашего магазина. Ой, это ой, в 9 ой, раз ой. больше, чем было продано группы Агата Кристи. Ты деньги снимаешь. И это в 6 раз больше, чем было продано на Утилус Пампириус. И в 3 раза больше, чем группа Металлика. Although Mumetal had a big cult following, and many artists praised the band, for example Alexander Lipnitsky of Zvuki Mu fame, Mumetal also faced a ton of backlash. One of Russia's biggest pop producers by the name of Max Fadeev would criticize the band's sound, calling it old-fashioned and claiming that their UK production didn't differ much from the Russian. Plethora of Soviet old heads such as Yuri Shevchuk and Mikhail Barzykin went on record as not understanding what the hype was about. And of course, you had Igor Ledov who name-dropped Mumitol as an example of a band that he is spiritually against. Or something like that, you know, it's Ledov talk. One common criticism, however, was the sugary pop commercial sound of the album. Mumitol quickly became one of the biggest talks of the country, with everybody having an opinion about Lekutenka's lack of underground cred and other stuff like that. Although for the Western ear, Mumitol's music is obviously influenced by the Britpop sound of the time, what would you expect from a Russian living in London? The clueless Russian journalist had no idea what to call this sort of sound. At one point, when Legutenko was asked to name the genre his band played, he jokingly answered rock a pops a synthesis of the word rock and the Russian derogative term for pop music, pops or popsa. This was the final blow to the Russian rock gatekeeper sanity. A Russian rock star who admits to making commercial music for the mainstream audience? Say it ain't so. The amount of seeding that came pouring on Mumetal can be felt to this day. I like to think of Mumetor as a sort of a Russian rock answer to what New Wave was to punk in the West. Like Vatienke came from the underground, but he had no interest in being another cult hero, Vasily Shum of Clone number 29. Why spend your energy always hating on things and being super depressing and political when we can have fun in the 90s? Although Mumetor never said that openly, that's basically the vibe a lot of people got from them, which resulted in a lot of hate and love at the same time. With Mumitoy's success, Russian labels started picking up more soft alternative rock acts. The gates were now open, and a wave of fresh rock pop's blood started pouring onto the mainstream TV channels and radio stations. Around the same time as Mumitoy had blown up, another old band got super popular in the country. This was the St. Petersburg band called Spleen. Spleen's story goes back to 80s Leningrad, when a young guy by the name of Alexander Vasiliev, along with his friends, one of whom was Oleg Kuvayev, better known as the creator of the cartoon Masyana, formed the band Mitra. Mitra played nice, mellow bard rock that was typical in 80s Leningrad, such as tambourine and early aquarium, for example. <laughs> Although the band had all the potential to join the Leningrad underground canon, Vasiliev was denied entry into the Leningrad Rock Club for having, quote, no talent. According to some rumors, the person who went Mitra out the most was Anatoly Gunitsky of Aquarium fame. I guess he didn't appreciate other bands ripping off his style. Anyway, just like Lagotenka, Vasiliev's music career had to be put on hold when he was called to serve in the army. Upon returning back home to a city that was now called St. Petersburg, Vasiliev would start working on writing new songs and obtaining various connections with local musicians. And so, the band that we now know as Spleen was formed. The band's first album, titled Pulne Bill, was released in 1994 and had little to do with sugary commercial rock pops. The music was more akin to artsy kitsch new wave, such as Eltilus Pompilius.
So we have a nice traditional light-hearted Russian new wave band. Where do you go to perform your music? Well, obviously you go to Tam Tam. You know the club which specialized in post-hardcore and was constantly raided by cops? Yeah, I think Spleen fits in just fine. Chimera, Tequila Jazz, Mjortvi Hippie, and Spleen. In 1996, Spleen would release their follow-up album titled Kalikcanyer Aruja. This album was more successful than their debut, perhaps due to the band changing the style around to something more guitar-based and less 80s. Or it may be due to the fact that the band performed at one of the biggest festivals of the year called Napoleon Nebo de Bratoi. In 1997, the band made their third album, Fonari Pod Glazom. Pretty solid alternative rock release right here. At this point, Spleen had a loyal cult following, but something prevented them from hitting that jackpot and breaking big across the entire country. Maybe it was the soft boy music, maybe it was the abstract lyrics that at times were just like completely nonsensical. This was a band that could break out into their mainstream, they just needed to wait for that right time. In 1998, the band's fourth record, Granato Valley Bomb, was released. And it was one of the biggest albums of the year. That's right, the time had come. Spleen had perfectly checked off all the check marks for rock and pop stardom. Soft boy alternative rock? Check. Apolitical? Check. Bouncy keyboard leads? Check. 90s aesthetics? Of course. There was one key difference between Mumitor and Spleen though. Spleen added an important element into the rock and pop's mix. That was the feels. <laughs> Я отключил телефон, завел на восемь будильник. Чью-то тетрадь кровью, как ветра If Marskaya was the Russian park life or different class, Granatov album was certainly the band's. Spleen always had a more minor tone. They weren't your average rock pops clowns prancing on the stage. They were the intellectuals. I mean, what else would you expect from a St. Petersburg band? Spleen continued releasing album after album, experimenting with the rock and pops formula, putting in bits of jazz, progressive rock, folk, and other stuff into the mix. This making Spleen one of the few Rocket Pops bands which is kind of acceptable to like. At least Grebenshikov was a fan. One of the most talented bands which I consider to be a part of the Rocket Pops subgenre was Bigimot, also from St. Petersburg. I have to mention though that Bigimot tried to distance themselves away from this tag, instead calling their music Pete Pop. 
no comments. Despite being super talented and all honestly better than 90% of the bands covered in today's video, Biggie Mott never made it out of SPB hood and remains to be a local underground phenomenon. Seriously though, give this band a shot. Privishka is some of the best 90s alternative rock I have ever heard. The success of Wumyotol and Spleen was a clear sign to other artists that in order to make it big, you had to incorporate at least some element of that sweet rock pop sound in your music. One person who got that was Nike Barzov, one of the OGs of Russian indie music, who worked with the band Infekcia and also had a phenomenal solo career. <laughs> Нам показала на запад она и говорит, что проводит туда. И вот мы идем уверенным шагом. Дошли наконец туда, куда хотели. Возьми меня с собой на помойку. Возьми меня с собой. After three albums that garnered a moderate amount of success, Borzov, just like the Metal, fell into the hands of the MTV PR machine, and became a poster child for the Russian youth with his hit record Superman. Quite possibly the best rock pops album of all time, the white pony of rock pops. Nike Barzov delivered a more stripped back approach with less synths and gloss but more feel and a bigger influence from the American indie sound. Лучше как предвестник ночи, словно призрак тамагочи влезла в окно. Бардак в моей голове, а мне все равно. Верхом на звезде, над лесом реку. Буду 
Hashem will be. Но достав револьвер, ты сказала прощай своей нежной рукой. Ты открыла мне рад, а я сидел и молчал, немного скучал. Ты достала ключи, сказала прости. Blurring the lines between sincerity and humor, with various songs being able to hit you in a different way depending on your mood, Nike Brzov crafted an absolute masterpiece. If Mumitoid appealed to the normies and split into the people with the I'm not like the other syndrome, Nike's laid back nature, humorous personality, and indie background quickly made him the hero of the slacker youth. Superman is still one of the most critically acclaimed rock and pops albums of all time, and has a high rating on Rachel Music, for example. By now, I think it's time we introduce some of the main characters in this whole story. The man who pushed the sound onto the Russian public and defined a large portion of the 1990s. One of the most controversial people in Russian music history. Love him or hate him, when it comes to rock and pops you can't go without him. I am talking about Mikhail Kozarev. Программный директор Радио Максимум в 98 году открыл радиостанцию Наше Радио. Основатель фестиваля Максидром в нынешнее время занимается проектом нашествия. Работает по 20 часов в сутки, открывает новые имена, пропагандирует хороший вкус, любит нашу музыку. Здрасте. Здравствуйте. Михаил, вы первое лицо популярной московской радиостанции «Наше радио». Какая музыка звучит у вас в эфире? Мы играем много разных направлений в музыке, и э, даже не только русскоязычные песни. У нас звучат песни на украинском языке, на молдавском языке, на э, самых разных по, пару языках. Но вот э, именно самое главное, самое ключевое, то, что мы заявляем в начале каждого часа, это самая богатая коллекция рок-н-ролла. Козырев was born in Екатеринбург and got an education as a medic. In the early 90s, he was in a relationship with an American girl named Kimberly, who asked Kozarev to move to the States with her. And so, Kozarev started saving up money to move. Young Kozarev was accepted into Panama College, where his girlfriend was studying at the time. While studying in California, Kozarev had two things happen to him. First of all, Kozarev hosted his first ever radio show on college radio, where he attempted to introduce his peers and UD to Soviet bands such as Stanley Igri, Bravo, Aquarium, and the Plinsky Marsh. The second important thing that Kozarev witnessed was the cultural change in America from 80s glam and AOR to 90s grunge and alternative rock. Вот. А там, в Лос-Анджелесе, радиостанции, они находились прямо на расстоянии 2-3 мм друг от друга на диапазоне. И самая крутая из них была радиостанция K-Rock. K-R-O-Q. Это станция, которая фактически всему миру открыла стиль гранж. То есть ровно в тот момент, когда я попал в Калифорнию, на верхушку чартов вознеслось Smells Like Teen Spirit, Нирваны, и ты слушал станцию, на которой были подряд Red Hot Chili Peppers, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Soul Asylum, Depeche Mode, Tori Amos, Alanis Morissette. Короче, это был рай абсолютный. Я не представлял себе, что может быть так круто. When Kozarev returned to Russia due to family reasons, he was determined to start a career as a producer and DJ on the radio. But not just any radio, Kozarev wanted to bring the American format to Russia. This not only meant slick designs and catchy jingles, but also fresh new music. Kozarev's first claim to fame was with Maximum Radio, which helped out the band Magatha Christie in becoming popular. Radio, 
but Khosrev's biggest claim to fame happened later with the creation of Nasha Radio. Depending on who you ask, the station was a god set that helped revive rock music in the country or the devil reincarnated that almost killed it. The station's idea was fairly simple, demonstrate the best rock music that the country has to offer on a major scale. Although nowadays the station is synonymous with being the most stale, conservative and boring station on the planet, back in its early years Nasha Radio would promote some good bands such as Tequila Jazz, Billy's Band and Nogos Filo for example. Although Kozarev still played some songs from old bands to garner listeners, the band had envisioned a new European sound for the country, which was, you guessed it, rock pops Spleen, Mumitroy, Nike Barzov, these were all artists that in part got popular thanks to Nasha Radio. In 1996 Maximum, добавляет в себя вот эту новую линию русской альтернативной музыки. Kazarev would create the soundtrack and other media platforms would follow. Kazarev likes your band? Congratulations, have yourself a hit song. Kazarev doesn't like your band? You are left stuck in the underground. Назови мне, ну, можешь три, можешь меньше, можешь больше, групп, которых, о которых ты жалеешь, что в свое время ты им отказал в нашем радио. Ага. Вопрос задан с Нет, крайне... я не подбираюсь со скрытым подтекстом. Я не подбираюсь к гражданской обороне, кроме гражданской обороны. Это хороший вопрос, потому что на него сложно ответить. Я очень хорошо помню, как... Ты знаешь, каждая... Их немного таких историй, но каждая из этих историй имеет хэппи-энд, потому что я отказал группе, она доказала, что она состоятельна либо на клипах, либо на других радиостанциях, и я ее неизбежно взял в эфир. Kozarev became such a well-known figure that practically every week he would have tens if not hundreds of demo tapes sent to his station from all across Russia and neighboring countries. Although musically very different, Kozarev managed to create his own grunge and nirvana in a way that helped put the old generation of bands into the category of dinosaurs. This meant that Kozarev became hero to some and public enemy number one to the others. Частым таким выражением, что 90-е русскому року дали только Земфиру и Метроли, все, в принципе. Я считаю, что нет, в 90-е было еще несколько хороших групп, но они совершенно не позиционировали себя как, как русский рок. И, кстати говоря, были не слишком востребованы на нашем радио и фестивале нашествия. Я имею в виду, скажем, такие, ну, из, из известных, скажем, это группы Мегаполис до сих пор прекрасно существующие. Я думаю, если бы их назвали русским роком, Нестеров бы просто передернуло. Это какие-то авангардные группы, скажем, собаки табака московские, химера питерская. Такие были. На самом деле у нас были очень интересные группы в 90-е годы, но их вообще не водилось на этом тоскливейшем, позорнейшем нашем радио. Наше радио, оно сгубило русский рок своим форматом. О чем вы говорите? Anyway, as I already mentioned, in roughly about three years, rock pops became all the rave in the Eastern Bloc, and that trend exceeded beyond St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Russia in general. From Ukraine, there was Okyanese, one of Kozarev's proudest achievements when it came to helping out bands. Okyanese brought a powerful anthemic arena rock feel to rock pops, mostly thanks to the recognizable and powerful voice of Svetoslav Vakarchuk. <laughs>
Another great rock and pop band from Ukraine was Tabula Rasa. Although I find less people raving about them than say Okeanese, I prefer Tabula Rasa's more carefree style of rock pops. From Belarus there was B2. B2 was one of the rock pops bands where the Soviet post-punk influence can be best heard. Just like Mumitrol, B2's story goes back to the Soviet years. The band won the prize for the best group at the first ever rock festival in Minsk. Later the band's two main songwriters Locha and Shura B2 would move to Australia where they would continue their career playing with local musicians and recording albums. <laughs> Latvia there was Brainstorm, also known as Rata, Vatra. Brainstorm was one of the best bands to be lumped in with the Rock Pops fad and probably one of the closest to the original UK sound. Also, it's important to know that Brainstorm was actually playing this kind of music before Mumitol, but their major claim to fame, that being outside of Latvia at least, happened later in the decade. In the meanwhile, as Kozarev was pushing the rock pop sound to the masses, the godfathers of rock pops, Mumitrol, had already released their follow up record Ikra in the same year as Marskaya. <laughs> Tak 
the album was just as successful as the previous record. Like Gutenko had created his own label that would release Mumia Toys records as well as another rock and pops band from Vladivostok called Tumane Ston and an electronic band Dedushki for some reason. The band would also record a single for a New Year's because Russians don't do Christmas like that and perform a concert in Japan, a country that Lagutenko would spend a lot of time in. While Lagutenko lived out his inner weeaboo dreams, Mumitoi's band members were called to help out an up-and-coming singer from Ufa. Her name? Zimfira. <laughs> Soon to be one of the most well-known female artists in Russian music history, Zemfira started her musical career on a local radio in Ufa, doing jingles and that sort of stuff. Zemfira had completed education as a jazz vocalist, and having her talents be wasted on some unknown radio station in the Republic of Bashkortostan was not the way to go. After handing a demo tape to the right people at the Maxidrome Festival, Zemfira was signed to a major label. Zemfira's first hit song was a lovely little romantic ballad called AIDS. A song that best fit a soundtrack to the imaginary Russian adaptation of Kids. The song immediately blew up due to the taboo nature of the lyrics but also due to the mystery. Who is this singer that just came out of nowhere singing about AIDS? Unlike the peaceful, happy-go-lucky rock and pop Spears, Zemfira stood out for her attitude. Despite working with members of Mumetol, Zemfira publicly expressed her dislike for the band's hit album Marskaya, calling it stupid, and not being afraid to show her disinterest or even mock certain aspects of Russian show business and that sort of stuff. This is best exemplified in Zemfira's performance at the cult TV show Anthropologia, where the young singer-songwriter would step into open conflict with the callers on the show. In an era when most Russian female singers were either part of the trashy Eurodance clique or playing the role of the modern artsy chick, having an average girl with a guitar come in and deliver songs with attitude was a breath of fresh air and something that the Russian public started eating up immediately. A gigantic brand of Zemfira clones started popping up out of nowhere. A new version of Zemfira appears practically every few years, however as you could probably guess, nothing beats the original. In the year 2000, the controversial movie Brat 2 was released. The film became really popular in Russia and would even influence Western media such as the video game Grand Theft Auto 4 for example. Along with the movie came the cult soundtrack that was curated by none other than Mikhail Kozarev. What in this chicken, I brought Alexei Balabanov compact discs that were then made the soundtrack of the film Brat 2. The soundtrack is a sort of greatest hits of the rock and pops era, containing well-known songs by B2, Okeaneza, Spleen, Zemfira, Smyslavuje, Gelitsenatse, and more. Tip 
замедлена дно Мы зажгли огни Во вселенной только мы Rock Apostles was not only a mainstream phenomenon, but also a soundtrack to one of the most popular films in the country. And many other movies would follow, like Barzoff in Down House, Mumetrol in Din Radio, Underwood and Mumetrol again in Peter FM, pick a popular Russian movie from the early to mid 2000s and you will bump into some sort of Rock Pop song on the soundtrack. Пожаловать на третий рок-фестиваль нашествия, беспрецедентную трансляцию которого проводят сегодня наше радио и телекомпания ТВ6. Тысячи народа, десятки тысяч народу приехали в маленький подмосковный городок Равенская, который, похоже, даже не готов к такому нашествию. Ведь такой некий вудсток, российский вудсток, потому что люди будут жить в палатках, тусоваться, оттягиваться, все, как им велят организаторы нашествия. Нашествие — это фестиваль, который позволяет выступить здесь не только звездам, не правда ли, Гриша, но и а, совершенно новым группам, которых не знает никто или которых знают немногие, но которые имеют право быть на этой сцене. Around the same time as Broadway came out, Kozarev would organize the Nashestia Festival, which hosted a lot of the rising stars in the rock pop genre. There were hundreds of these sort of bands, as I already mentioned, and talking about them in great detail would extend the video to another couple hours. So here's a small list of the few rock and pop bands that I think might be of possible interest. From St. Petersburg, there was Multfilm, one of the quintessential rock and pop bands that had a bigger rock edge than the others. <laughs> One of the classic and most remembered rock and pops albums of all time was Nipsih by the band Torba na Kruce, probably the softest of soft boy bands at the time. A must listen for fans of bands like Spleen. Torba na Kruce is another St. Petersburg band that gets a pass by the purists as a rock and pops band which is acceptable to like. Субтитры 
собой Я не псих, не псих Только скажи, не псих Я не псих, не псих, не псих, не псих, не псих One of the most talented rock and pop bands to my ear was Guitar Stereo from Kaliningrad. These guys really got the anthemic and stylish feel of Britpop and combined it with catchiness of American power pop and 90s indie music. Better than many of their peers from the capital, must I say. <laughs> From Rostov na Danu, there was Chiboza, a band whose entire catalog feels like a soundtrack to some 2000s romance drama. The band's main singer and songwriter Vasily Goncharov would become more well known later in the decade when he took on the pseudonym Vasily Oblomov and released one of the first Russian songs to blow up thanks to the internet titled Yedov Magadan. <laughs> Perhaps the most musically interesting and original band from the rock and pop scene, however, was the St. Petersburg band Polusa. The band included elements of light prog and alternative rock in their sound. The music feels less like a Mumia Troll or Oasis clone, but more like a look into an alternative reality where Tequila Jazz decided it was time to go mainstream. 
юная, счастливая. Band's debut album, Poesia, is one of the crowning achievements of Rocker Pops in my humble opinion. And personally, I think it's Rocker Pops' peak also. This great band, which elevated the rock pop genre, however, is mostly remembered as a one hit wanderer who did a song with Tattoo. As the older bands released a new album, 30 new copycats emerged every minute. It seemed like rock pops was here to stay, but at last, everything has to come to an end. If I had to place a marker at which exact time did rock pop start falling off, it would probably be between 2004 and 2005. Mumitrol and Spleen was a great breath of fresh air. Multfilm, Polusa and Chibozo was a great addition also, but by the time you had bands such as Zveri and Bratia Grimm coming out, it was clear that Rocket Pop's fatigue is unavoidable. When La Gutenka released Marskaya, it was an original, fresh, and in a way brave work which shaped the dying Russian music industry. By the time Korny was putting out its records, this music became stale and boring, with nothing new to offer besides delivering mindless disposable pop songs about nothing. If this sort of distancing away from politics and realism was in high demand during the 90s and early 2000s, by the time that the mid and late 2000s rolled around, the art and culture was shifting in a completely different direction. Привет, Питер. Привет всем. Группа Контейнер. Зашлет вам привет. So, what exactly killed rock pops? The answer may differ depending on who you ask. Was it the rise in heavy alternative music? Maybe it was Russia's growing interest in pop rap and hip hop in general. Maybe the pop crowd just grew tired of it and wanted something simpler and more fun. Although all those things did play a part in Rock of Pops' downfall, I think the real killer of Rock of Pops was Rock of Pops itself. Although all the things I mentioned did play a part in Rock of Pops' downfall, 
There was one advantage that Rock of Pops had over every other genre at the time. That was the media. Rock of Pops bands were still shilled everywhere. New Year's specials, movie soundtracks, TV programs. The record labels continued pushing this music onto the masses, but practically all the key bands had already lost all the interesting potential they once had. When B2 released their self-titled album, it had a good varied sound. The band was attempting to bring fresh western music they heard while in Australia to Eastern Europe. Practically every song on the album was a hit of some sort. A couple years later, the band has completely gotten rid of their cool post-punk influences, instead churning out wannabe U2 schlock. At one point, energetic and controversial Lagutenka went from being able to create two iconic albums in the span of a year to constantly changing Mumbito's aesthetic and style. Yeah, we're this alternative rock band from Vladivostok, we're too cool for all the show business crap in Russia, see us perform in Japan. You know what, nah nah, we are a harmless pop band, see us perform at Eurovision. Scratch that, we are a cheeky indie band made up of pitchfork reading hipsters. Actually, no, scratch that also. Here's an electronic remix of our old 1997 hit Utikai, but sung in Mandarin for our Chinese audience. Actually, you know what? We never wanted international acclaim anyway. Here is us doing lo-fi post-punk for the sad Russian Duma generation. Despite constantly changing styles and members, it's still the two 1997 albums Ikra and Marskaya that people remember. Spleen went from being one of the most musically diverse and interesting bands in this weird subgenre of Britpop to putting out generic mainstream rock with the occasional sad attempt at proggy outrock such as Muse. And I'm not talking about the good early Muse. Same thing goes for Okyanelze, who at one point were able to capture the hearts of the entire post-Soviet bloc with their emotional fist-pumping music. But now the band makes the same old overproduced polished pop rock, whose only intent is to be used as a background menu music for FIFA games. The bands which weren't lucky enough to garner a cult following early on remain to be one or at best two hit wonders with no real career after the fall of rock pops. Instead, these bands mostly just play shows for the people who want to relive their youth. The only rock pops artist who didn't fade away or sabotage their own career was Zimfira. Even though I'm personally not the biggest fan of the albums released past Vendetta, every new Zimfira album is still a source of big hype, media buzz, and rapid discussion amongst fans and haters. In 2005, Mikhail Kozarev was fired from Nasha Radio. With Kozarev gone, there was nobody to steer the wheel in terms of the musical progress. And so, Nasha Radio went from being the station where Russians got to first hear Okyanese and B2 to a glorified nostalgia fest, which plays the same rocket pops hits from the 90s and early 2000s. The Nashestvia festival, which at one point let people hear the popular rocket pops bands, alongside other hip artists at the time such as Dolphin, Mihe, Nogus Velo, Revolver, and even Psyche, yes, Psyche played at the Nashestia festival, to getting the reputation of being one of the dirtiest festivals with the same acts every year. Also, you have the Russian military advertising themselves now. So basically, imagine the Juggalo Fest but with fat Russian Z boomers and instead of Twista and ICP, the only music you hear is Picnic or something. That's an image for your nightmares. With Kozarev gone and most of the bands taking a step back in terms of creating interesting music, Rocka Pops quickly got overshadowed by new and better genres. Rocka Pops went from a new hip genre to a big punching bag. Nasha Radio and the Nashestvia Festival became a thing of mockery, with everyone making jokes about it. Кто здесь? Мы диссиденты на вашем радио, поэтому я буду об этом говорить, а что? Какое у меня должно быть настроение? Миша Козырев мой кумир, что ли, или что? Нет, Нет не, я не, про, не прошу. Может быть, кто у вас группа метро, а кто у вас группа Зефира? Что такое Рокопопс? Возьми любой их текст, уберем оттуда живые гитары, которые писали музыканты из Англии, поставь туда просто драм-машину, и будут руки вверх. А эти тут еще, ну это рок, какой рок вообще? Сидели бы в Австралии, би два, короче, ненавижу вообще это все говно. Я вот Мишу лично знаю. Он, у меня жена у него ассистентом на серебряном дожде и на дожде работал. Он очень приятный человек, с отличным музыкальным вкусом на импортную музыку. Вот что касается отечественной музыки. And that's pretty much the end of the story. Whether you love rock pops or hate it, 
It's an important part of Russian music history. Not just Russian music history, but the entire post-Soviet bloc, really. For us, it's quite an interesting experiment because it was basically the first time when Russian rock music got separated into the category of mainstream commercial rock and the underground non-commercial rock, with rock pops obviously being the commercial side. Although currently rock pops is still in the category of uncool, maybe in a couple of decades it's gonna get some sort of reappraisal. The same way Soviet synth pop and new wave got popular again even though it was also deemed uncool for some time. You never know really. Maybe now's the time to blow the dust off your Multfilmy album. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe for more Eastern Bloc music content, and share the videos with others. Leave a comment with your take on Rocket Pops. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Is Nasharadio the Antichrist? Just don't forget to join the Discord, okay? For those people who are only interested in the underground gems, you know, the ones where you can't even tell what is being done due to the poor Soviet tape quality, don't worry, as I will be doing more deep cut videos later. So yeah, that's been the story of Rocket Pops. See you in the next video. Bye bye.